Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, David, for including me, um, for having the conversation. Is Congressman Val Demings here still? I wanted to thank her for doing all the work that she's done. I know she's a police officer and she was a social worker. I have both in my family. My brother's a police officer in Philadelphia. My sister's a social worker. My mother was a social worker. I understand public service. And uh, my father was a minister and I'm an actress. How about that? So <laughs> there's people who do other things. But um, I've been in media my whole life. I've been in the game for 37 years after I was discovered in a basement theater called Freedom in Philadelphia. But I spent the first 11 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight on Route 66 in Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, where my father was an itinerant preacher and my mother was a teacher. And they made their living going around healing people and doing revivals and um, getting the Holy Ghost and throwing off the devil. They could have had, they could have made a lot of money in D.C. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad I got that um, the way, that entrance into uh, the industry. Because in a way, I think uh, a lot of people of color come in through strange doors. But I think especially uh, African Americans are introduced to entertainment and um, performance through our great uh, pastors and ministers and the people who sing in our um, communities. So I just wanted to let you know that um, I'm lucky to have uh, been uh, in that family. It was a difficult way to go, but it was the right way for me. Um, we're talking about challenges of media owners in color, in, in, uh, of color, and I recently became a media owner by creating a company with my partner, Ben Arnon, and we've been out there hustling and seeing the lay of the land, and it is a rough ride. I don't care how you come to it or what you have behind your resume, and I think that that's an issue. Um, so I'm going to be asking uh, our um, panelists who have created amazing uh, companies and who have been successful in it, not only what's, what, how do they do it, but more importantly, what's going on now and how can we continue to do it and for, new, for new people who want to get into it and also uh, the challenges with um, the big media companies. So we're going to call up um, Carla Santiago, who's a co-founder of UNCMN. MMN, Dewan McCoy, CEO of Bayou City Broadcasting, Tim Wang, CEO, CEO Fiscal Note and CQ Roll Call, Londell McMillan, attorney and owner of The Source Magazine. Is he here? He is? Okay. Well, Londell's going to be coming up. Um, I want to thank uh, the MMCA for uh, creating a space like this. Um, I, I, if I could have invented it, I would have. Um, and they do it, you're doing it very well. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to start off, because we're talking about ownership. We have to, where you talk about ownership, you have to talk about money. And uh, where you talk about money and ownership, you have to talk about data and advertising and branding. And that's all of what you do. Um, our color just happens to be how we come through that door, which I think it makes us very powerful, but also it can be um, a liability depending on who's on the other side of that room or how they see us. So um, we're also gonna leave a little space for questions. So if you wanna take notes and you get a chance to have some questions, that'll be great. And you can ask them anything. And please look in the, uh, the book for their bio to, because they're really heavy people. What I'm gonna ask them now is to each introduce themselves again, and then say a little bit about what they're doing now, currently. Uh, I'll start off, uh, and I'll be brief. Dewan McCoy, uh, owner, president, and CEO of Bayou City Broadcasting. Uh, I own five television stations, uh, two Fox affiliates, one CBS, one NBC, one My Network. Just agreed to buy uh, the uh, CW, which is a big news station in my hometown. Indianapolis, Indiana, for $42 million. Uh, I got, I've raised over $200 million to buy television stations, and I've been in the television station game since 2007. Purchasing. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Tim Wong, uh, founder and CEO of a company called Fiscal Note. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know Fiscal Note, we are one of the, uh, I think we are the largest technology business uh, startup here in Washington, D.C., uh, what we do is we aggregate uh, legislation, regulations, court cases, government documents from 
uh, dozens of countries around the world and sell to roughly about 4,000 different uh, organizations. Uh, about two years ago, we started diversifying our business into the media space. Um, uh, you know, picked up a couple of different properties uh, out in Belgium. Uh, actually, uh, our most recent property was a, a property called uh, Congressional Quarterly on Roll Call, uh, which we carved out of The Economist Group um, for about $180 million uh, last August. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, CQ Roll Call are, are pretty historic Washington uh, publications and, and media properties, uh, which for almost, uh, I guess, almost 140 years have been uh, combined 140 years have been have been uh, you know telling the stories of Capitol Hill, the White House, and a lot of the regulatory agencies. Um, uh, we have uh, you know very similarly raised about 230 million dollars. Our backers include folks like uh, Mark Cuban, Jerry Yang, Steve Case, uh, you know Apollo, uh, The Economist, and S&P. Uh, we've been very very uh, helpful in terms of us continuing to build uh, our business over the last couple of years. I'm Carla Santiago. I'm co-founder of Uncommon. We are a multicultural, diverse and inclusive talent management and entertainment strategy firm. I am head of partnerships, and in my role, I partner brands with storytellers of color to help them promote stories, whether it's TV and film, help them co-finance or co-market um, their stories. Uh, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Well, we may not know where Carmen Santiago is, but we know where Carla Santiago is. And that's good to think. I'm going to ask Juan to start off um, ownership, property. So we all know Tyler Perry comes up when we think ownership. Um, I'm to also talking about IP, original IP, um, original creation of IP. So you think of Ava DuVernay, Ridley, uh, John Ridley, uh, Kenya Barris in that space. But you are literally doing in both spaces. And what's phenomenal is that... Um, I wouldn't have known you were existed and were doing so well and being so successful. So please give us what the what you, what has worked for you. So in a snapshot, and I will I'll try to be brief in all my statements. I tend to be long winded, but uh, so I'll be brief. So I've been in the TV game since 1989, and I started by learning how to run TV stations. Okay, in 2007, I worked for Rupert Murdoch in Houston. Got tired of making everybody else the money. Okay, got tired of it. Uh, went to Houston. The station was billing ninety million dollars. Four years later, I had the revenue up to one hundred fifty million dollars. Okay, and that was on my strategy and my back. I was making other people money. So I left in two thousand seven, and I bought seven small market television stations in San Angelo, Texas, for three million dollars. They were on the market for ten years, and nobody wanted them. They were fixer uppers. Okay, I bought them in two thousand. Eight, right during the financial crisis. In 2012, I sold them for $21 million. And I didn't have any partners. That got the attention of huge backers, big money people like Bain Capital, U.S. Bank. I uh, did my little presentation to them. They said, wow, how did you do it? I explained to them how I did it with my systems, my management style. And they said, okay, great. Let's go buy some stations together. I said, wonderful. We bought Evansville, Indiana, a CBS and a Fox, in January 2015 for $27 million. We bought the NBC, Fox, and My Network in January 2017 for $40 million. That's $60 million. I fixed them up. Last week, I just sold them to Byron Allen for $165 million. That's what's up. Wow. Last week, we just closed selling those TV stations from one black man to another black man, the brought five broadcast TV stations. While at the same time, I agreed to purchase in my hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana, the CW, which was a former CBS station, which is a huge news station, and the WNDY, which is my network affiliate, from Next Star Broadcasting for $42 million. So bought some, fixed them up, sold them, bought some more, fixed them up, sold them to another black man, and I'm staying in the game by going home to Indianapolis. So that's, in a nutshell, what I do. That's amazing. Sounds like an HGTV show. <laughs> you know, flip the script. You know what I'm saying? That's what's up. I mean, but, I mean, you, 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 you say it. Look, I know that's not easy. I know I'll make it sound easy, don't I? 
Yeah, yeah, but I can even see how you lean forward. You running hot, man. So, you know, tell, 100%, us, 20%. You know, tell us what we need to, to, to sort of think like that because I don't even know how, how'd you come to even say, okay, I'm going to buy me a TV station. I know you said you were working for Rupert Murdoch and you said, now I'm going to do it I for I work myself. for a lot Did of you? different people and I work exactly. for a lot of smart people. And I've been cursed or blessed with the entrepreneurial gene uh, and the driven gene. And I was, I'm cut from the cloth of whenever I get to one spot, guess what I want to do? Move to the next. Go to the next one. So the pinnacle of what I wanted to do was ownership. And I was uh, influenced by a gentleman when I was 23 years old. He was 38 and owned a bunch of TV stations. And he came to my TV station, and I was a sales guy. And he said, hey, I'd like to hire a lot of people in my sales department that are athletes that want to make a lot of jack. And he, I was 23 at the time. He was 38. I'm saying to myself, wow, he's a CEO. He can talk like that. Okay, so he influenced me right away, and from that moment forward, he became my inspiration, mm -hmm. and I start saving my money and start doing things to, to get me to the path of owning television stations. And I got to tell you, that was back in 1990s, and people told me then, there's no way, there's no way you're going to own local broadcast TV stations. Can't happen. The business is consolidating. Cable's going to take over. The internet's going to come, okay? Didn't listen to them. Didn't listen to them at all. And I've bought a total of seven, five, 12 television stations since then. No, take that back. 14, because I haven't closed on Indianapolis yet. 14 television stations since then. So. Fantastic. We're going to come back and ask about funding from you, Dewanda. We're going to, uh, let's introduce, um, we kind of lost you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Londell. Millen, if you can tell pe people who you are, just a little bit of what you do, and I'm going to ask you a question straight off. I'm going to come back to Carla and Tim. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, I was actually early. I was here much earlier. <laughs> they took me to the green room, and then I got lost. But anyway, pleasure. Thank you. Um, and hello, David, and hello, all of you. Uh, my name is Londell McMillan. I'm an attorney. Many people know me as an entertainment attorney over the years, many, many years, represented and managed people from the late great Prince, Stevie Wonder, Isaac Hayes, all down to LL Cool J, Nas, and Little Kim. So very broad range. Um, companies like Mercedes-Benz, TV One, Radio One, and others. Um, I transitioned into media by buying a, a number of different websites and I was able to take over and buy the iconic Source magazine. If any of you know, Source is celebrating its 30th anniversary. It was founded by actually two white guys from Harvard University. It became the iconic media publication for this thing that we know and call hip hop culture. I got into that because um, as, a, as a lawyer and as someone from the community, I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. Um, I was part of this thing we called and built as hip hop. And I was not happy with the direction that it was always have going. And it was something I thought that given my insights and my connections and ability, we can take this brand and do something powerful with it. And so with a national brand, international brand, that's able to actually attract a lot of eyeballs across digital, social, mobile, print, we've been able to do a lot of great things. And so, uh, and turn it more, more so, not into a magazine, but we turned it into a media media business. And when I first got into um, the entertainment business, you know, having built and developed the largest uh, minority owned uh, law firm in New York State, you know, people had said, don't go into entertainment law. They said that entertainers, they don't, they don't, they won't hire a black lawyer. They said, you know, they don't hire, they only hire Jewish and Italian lawyers. And I said, oh, really? Okay. So then we broke that ceiling, similar to your story. Um, we broke that ceiling, and I, th I thought that media would be a piece of cake. But after being in the media now for about 11 years, I think it was easier going in the music and entertainment business and fighting Hollywood than it has been um, trying to deal with the advertisers and all of the different uh, forces in media. So I'm glad to be here, and I'll stop right there. Okay. Thank you. Well, listen, we want to ask you a question. Um, you've done a lot, and we talk, we, since we're talking about ownership right now and, and property, actual literal property, 
you have this, um, you brought the uh, Brooklyn Nets and you then you um, created Atlantic Yards. Yeah. Which is a, tell us about that, please. Well, you, you mentioned ownership. Ownership has always been at the core of, of my DNA. My mother was a beautician, um, came up from Milledgeville, Georgia, in town where we built up our own, <laughs> you know. And Got somebody so, in the house. So, you know. It, it was one of those things where she was her own entrepreneur, and we lived in the projects, and she was still buying stuff. So, yeah, I could tell you the mentality of the person who was my, my influence. And so ownership was key. Um, it became even more so in a very public dispute with Prince when Prince had the word slave on his face. And many of you may, who are, who are old enough to remember Prince was running around with slave on his face. And that's when he uh, enlisted my services, and I said to him, how did we get... How do we get that slave off your face? Um, and so we enlisted an ownership agenda around owning his masters and master recordings. And so any and every opportunity that allows for an opportunity to have equity and a piece of the pie, it was something that was very, very important, particularly when the consumer ultimately is a diverse and multicultural consumer. And the content comes from people of color, uh, and all people around the country. So if you have a product that is multicultural, you have a consumer that's multicultural, it raises the question, how come you don't have ownership that's multicultural? And so um, in order for us to truly have a true, I think, diversity of, in democracy and freedom of speech and voice, it was all about owning and getting a piece of the pie. And so when the when the New Jersey Nets were thinking about coming to Brooklyn, um, they wanted to use public land. Um, just like a lot of the broadcasters want to use public airways and get public benefits and so forth. Um, so when you receive benefits from the public, those who are our public elected officials should have a duty to make sure that whatever policies are being promulgated have a public purpose and allows for true democracy and, and inclusion. And so I asked when they came to me for an investment, I said, well, I'd be interested in being an investor uh, only if it, re it revolves around equity in the community, having the opportunity to participate in community benefits, agreements, and, 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 and it's a fair, equitable deal. So that's how I got involved. They wanted to actually come to, to, come to my hometown, Brooklyn, um, and they understood that Brooklyn was a population that had a lot of people of color. And, and I said, well, you're not going to just, what, you're, what we're not going to do is just utilize me as, as um, wallpaper and window dressing. Um, you know, we have to have equity so that we can have inclusion. So I'll stop right there because I'm sure there'll be other, other points. No, and we're going to, we're going to also talk, uh, hopefully get in specifics. Tim, again, I got you, Carla. I'm setting you up. Um, again, ownership, data. That's another place where that's, uh, uh, you know, kind of sketchy about who owns what, the analysis of. We're all afraid that we're being overanalyzed, boxed in, or worse, toxic um, uh, bias algorithms, uh, telling them who we are and we ain't. Uh, you own um, a data so let, let tell them, you know, I'm trying to get into this space. Yeah, so um, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons why we started our company in the very beginning was that we felt like the media landscape was, was uh, transforming quite rapidly. And um, uh, basically every traditional form of advertising revenues is falling off a cliff. Um, you know, whether it's in print circulations all the way out to uh, even, uh, you know, online advertising. Um, and... Um, the one true form of consistent high margin revenues has always been in data um, and in uh, sort of information services. Um, and if you look at sort of very, very large media businesses like Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg, um, even uh, a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, like Dow Jones and the like, a lot of the, the core backing of those businesses were supported by uh, uh, substantial recurring high margin data businesses that um, were sustainable over the very, very long term. Um, now, these revenues are actually substantially more valuable. They're, you know, on, on the public markets trading at, you know, 12, 15, 20 times revenues um, for, for good reason, right? Because they're sticky and they're, and they're recurring and the like. Um, so um, at Fiscal Note, we wanted to build essentially the Bloomberg Terminal for law, um, basically aggregating 
um, every law, every regulation um, across the world, um, and then building uh, essentially a data subscription business for lawyers and government agencies and law firms and the like. Um, and then we wanted to use that as a platform to be able to invest in great journalism in the future. Um, and not many people know this, but um, you know these these organizations they don't have to invest in media. Um, you know they they can just pump the cash out to their shareholders on a pretty consistent basis and, and issue pretty substantial dividends. Uh, but I think in our case, you know, as we grew our business, as we aggressively started scaling our organization, hitting, you know, 100, 500, 1,000, 4,000 subscribers and organizations, um, our subscriptions are somewhere between, you know, call it 20,000, half million dollars a year. Um, we, we now had sort of the resources and the capability to start investing in great journalism. Um, and so we are one of the very few newsrooms in Washington that are aggressively hiring, um, aggressively growing our news organization uh, because we very, very strongly believe in the future of, of that combination. So for us, when we think about the future of data, it's not just, you know, are you selling raw data feeds to individuals, but you're actually providing context around that information, right? So, um, you know, we can, we can continue to build our business selling raw court cases, raw regulations, um, and that's a great business by itself, but um, the ability to pro uh, essentially provide additional context, editorial analysis that sits on top of that information, I think is, is, is game changing. And so at least for Washington, um, before we came along, Washington never really saw a business like ours, um, you know, um, uh, grounded in core technology and data, um, making huge investments in artificial intelligence and natural language processing, and then obviously using that to invest in our, in our newsroom. Um, on the news side, actually, what's, what's really interesting is that um, it's, not, it's not an either or in terms of data or news, right? So um, we're actually leveraging a lot of the core data capabilities that we have to, to essentially build more efficient news organizations. Um, so uh, we have experiments, for instance, being able to um, take a look at uh, you know, state legislation, state regulations, municipal legislation, municipal regulations, and then use artificial intelligence to automatically create news stories um, that uh, are effectively uh, providing coverage to areas that, that uh, you know, a lot of folks are retrenching in terms of their investments. And so uh, you know, we, we view this sort of really cool intersection between technology, data, and news as to the future of journalism, the future of, of the direction of the industry as well. That's amazing. Um, Carla, he's talking about context and um, data, and to me, you're where the rubber meets the road because you're talking about branding and advertising. By the time it gets to you, it's going through, you know, all these powerful platforms and that um, they've either built or they're controlling in different ways, not just them, you know, uh, the players that we know. I've always been told, I mean, everybody, oh, we love you and living single, but we're the, we're the commercials for the advertising. And that's how that works. So um, that's, that's your specialty, um, branding and advertising. And, and, I, and I tell this quick story about the loss of revenue from uh, shows like Living Single because they undersold them. They didn't think that they were valuable, even though the, uh, the data told them how powerful they were and what markets. And, and so they sab sabotaged themselves which is odd because I know that because uh, a person who sold TV shows and put them in those markets told me that they were, um, um, they were surprised how many of uh, the shows with black casts, I don't call them black shows, but black casts were, were undervalued. Uh, that's your space right now. And everyone's fighting for awareness. So once was disposable, now everybody wants those eyes. They want any eyes they can get on a consistent basis. So you tell us, what you do to go in there and make uh, the brands aware. Hello. So um, let me give you some background. So I worked, I came into entertainment by mistake. Um, I worked at CAA, which is one of the biggest talent agencies. And working there and saying, and I still worked within brands. And so I was an executive agent. And I remember sitting in, in the rooms and saying, oh, you know, um, Coca-Cola reached out. We need someone, you know, digital talent of color can give me a list. And the agents would be like, well, we really don't have anybody. And like the people exist. They just, you know, people tend to look for people like themselves. So agents will sign talent that looks like them. And so when I saw that happening and I saw that there was a demand from the brand side, I decided to switch over to the brand side and learn a little bit about what brands and how brands think, right? And there I got to work with brands like Toyota, the North Face, et cetera, et cetera, and all these brands, what do they do? 
They hop on culture. But guess who creates the culture? Come on. And we give it away. And we give it away. And we don't own it. One of my mentors told me, uh, stop playing the game. Start your own game. Because I was trying to make it with NCAA and Edelman and all these companies, and I it just like couldn't. I was just hitting, hitting a, a ceiling. And he said, just create your own game. And that's how Uncommon came about. And one thing about Uncommon is, if you think about it, 57% of Americans skip ads within two seconds, right? A video, you're watching YouTube, a video pops up, what do you do? You look up. Wow. You're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. We are in an attention economy. It's not even about getting views, it's about capturing someone's attention. And the way you can truly capture someone's attention is through content. It's through social media, because they're following influencers on Facebook, they're following influencers on Instagram, on Snap, and they're streaming content. They're watching it on TV, on their phone, wherever it is, they're watching content. That's where they're paying attention. And so what I do at Uncommon is I find brands to align themselves with storytellers, with TV shows, with films, with influencers, to give money so that they can help support these stories, but at the same time, they're being integrated into these stories. So if you want to get, in, if you want to get attention, for instance, I'll give you an example. Insecure which is on HBO, HBO doesn't do ads, right? But they did host an after slay on BuzzFeed. That's a perfect opportunity for a brand to host that conversation. So align yourself with Insecure, a great piece of IP that has a huge following without interrupting the creative, right? Just own that, help them own that conversation about the show. So those are the type of partnerships that I do. It's I bring brands in to help storytellers tell their stories without being encumbered within creative, and at the same time, getting co-marketing, getting their stories out there. Um, and then the great thing about what I try to do is like, let's get that money, going back to your equity, so that these storytellers don't lose equity in their storytelling, right? So whether it's like working with an influencer who has a, like King Batch, right? He had, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with King Batch. He has a great channel. So working with brands like Toyota or Axe to get him funded so he can create, continue to create his shows and own them, right? So that's a little bit of what I do. And it's really, it, it's pretty complicated, but it's really marrying brands and content creators and looking to the future of where attention is. Um, I'd love to, I'm going to ask you a question that has to do with data with uh, uh, what you do in a second. But um, Dewan, um there's a feeling that we're all being played a little bit out here because of the consolidation you mentioned of the big, just trading hands like Freeform is really Disney and, you know, Warner Media is HBO and they're just glomming up everything. And, and for all the change we're talking about and all the, the, the restructuring and infrastructure that you're doing that might, you know, blow our minds, that, uh, that the, very few people really own media in the first place. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because we want to know eventually, you know, um, um, how can we change the game if that's true? So one of the things that, that's very prevalent in broadcasting is uh, what you call side cards, where you have a African-American uh, is a front or a side card for a bigger white company. Okay, I chose not to go there. I was invited to be a side card. I said, nope, I want to do my own game. I want to, I want to have equity. I want to own. I want to make the decisions. I want to come up with the program, and I want to do my own thing because I have the skills. Uh, so those are out there. Those don't work, okay, because you are being played when, when you become a side card. Um, for, for me, the... For expansion and for us to get ahead in the game, if you want to go the cable route, if you want to go nationwide, AT&T, DirecTV, Comcast, they control it. Charter, they control it. If you can't convince them, those three, to get distribution, we cannot play on a national space for anything multicultural, particularly as it relates to news or entertainment, okay? I've been working on a project with my buddy Jim Winston, who's the president of NABOB for about 18 months. Raise your head, Jim. 
Raise your hand, Jeff. Thank you. We've been talking to MVPDs, multi-video program distributors, about launching the Multicultural News Network. I let it out the bag. We're trying to launch the Multicultural News Network. I got great experience in launching the news, okay? They don't want to launch you, okay? They don't want to give us a platform. Why? Because you have horizontal antitrust or competition because they own news organizations, okay? They see where America is going 20 years from now, okay? There's going to be more brown people in America than there are going to be white people in America, okay? With that being said, they have a business model, okay? They're trying to keep their business model alive. Okay? They don't have diverse people to have a mindset to create a multicultural news network from a, from a heart standpoint and a passionate standpoint like I do. So if you can't convince those three MVPDs to give you national coverage, and when I say give you national coverage, they'll make me an offer. They've made me an offer, but it's got poison pills in it. Okay? How many people in this room are from Comcast? How many people in this room are from AT&T, DirecTV? How many people in this room are from DISH? How many people in this room are from Charter? Those are the people that need to be in the rooms when we're talking about distribution mm. and affecting mm. multicultural from a media standpoint. Mm. They control the pipelines. Broadcasters don't control the pipelines, okay? We're only allowed to own 39.6% of the country. Because if I want to launch the Multicultural News Network over the air, I couldn't do it. I couldn't be nationwide. Why? Because I'm only allowed 39.6%. And last time I checked, the government isn't issuing any more broadcast licenses. So I can't go create another license in a market like New York to broadcast my Multicultural News Network. So my only distribution outlet is MVPDs, Charter, AT&T, DirecTV, Comcast, okay? I've been pitching them. I've talked to every last one of them, okay? And what really gets me excited is when I go to last night's great event and I see the marquee headline sponsor Comcast. Comcast denied me distribution, okay? You want to promote multiculturalism, I'm the only African American in America that knows how to launch a news and I've already raised $500 million to launch my multicultural news network and I can't get a sniff. Ugh. You follow me? So for us, for us to make a difference going forward, we Ugh. need we need Congress people. We need to put the pressure not on not on uh, 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 broadcasters, but on those distribution platforms, those MVPDs, AT and T, Charter, Directv, Comcast, to distribute our product and not set us up to fail. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's because we talk about institutionalized racism in the structure and the infrastructure, and that's real. Good God. Um, where's the money, Londale? Where's the money? Where is the money? Because we have people, I mean, and let's act like you're not you. Can I, can I, you you yeah. sure can, but uh, both of y'all answer the question. No, we're going to both answer. Both of y'all answer the question. Let's act like you're not you because. You, you've been yeah. in the game for a while, and you didn't have the types of networks you had. You're exactly right. Just for a person out here, you know, where's the I'd like to answer this money question okay. because I've come from nowhere. I came from the projects, too, okay? And I came from not having any money other than my savings to start my TV station. So it depends on how much money you need. Okay. Okay, so it depends on how much money you need. For my first deal, I got a SBA backed loan in San Angelo, Texas. I needed $3 million to buy my first TV stations, and the first financial bank, a small regional bank in West Texas, saw what I was doing with the television station and said, you know what? I'll loan you money, but I'm going to get it insured by the government. So the government doesn't loan money. They just insure the money. You have to use your credit and your credit worthiness to go out and get a loan. So SBA, you can go up to $5 million on a loan. Now, if you want big money, okay, big money is like a Bain Capital. They only write checks for $20 million, okay? 
So there's different pots of money, and there's different requirements for different types of money. And the number one prerequisite for getting money from Bain Capital is, one, having good credit, two, having a track record of success, proven success, in owning, operating, running, and managing whatever property or whatever project you want. I would contextualize it a little bit differently without disagreeing with what he said, which I do, but that's just part of it. I, I would say contextually there, there's different buckets of money. I think you first start with where do you get the money. You start with yourself, friends, and family, right? That's, so we have to go back to the old school. Now, that's not a whole lot. Maybe some of you may, but you got to talk about your own friends and family money. Um, then there's loan money, um, and then there's private equity money that you're trying to raise and who you're trying to raise it from. Um, but it's not just the money, it's the cost of the money. What the pills in the terms for the money will be. Um, so friends, family, uh, also there are third parties who are investors, angels, angel investors. Um, you know, I started out in this whole business as a, as a young sports agent. And at the time, the money in the sports was nowhere near what we're seeing now, um, which is why you see a number of these athletes, they're soon going to become billionaires and and investors in um, media, as we see what LeBron James is doing while he's even playing, uh, because it takes it takes money to make more of an investment to build, and then a reinvestment of the money. Um, so for me, when people hear money, I often sometimes I used to get it confused as as um, dollars for personal consumption. Oh, that's not what we're talking. We're talking the resources to invest in the operations, the production, distribution, and return on your investment for something that will, will be of a service or a value for you, yours, and your community. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I know I, I laughed a little bit inside for friends and family because <laughs> that probably give me, you know, $1,500. I'm not lying to you because everyone's trying to do their own thing. And, and, and uh, frankly, I might rather try to go for a loan if I, didn't think, if I thought I qualified. You know, I don't, I don't think I do at, at the level he's talking about. But the reason I say that is because um, I'm out here right now and I'm experiencing in real time how people are saying go to these VCs, go to these angels, oh, and somebody has a fund, go to black VCs. They're underfunded. They're non-funded. They're making you jump through all these crazy hoops. And then when you get there, they say, oh, come to us when you're further along. And you'd be like, Lord, I'm about to die. There are tons of issues, I think, that they will give uh, a lot of uh, leeway to uh, different looking people. Maybe if you have a penis and white face, that suddenly when you come in the door and you have a black face, they need all these assurances. And the assurance, they want you to be very successful before they even look at you. The thing you talk about with these people having money athletes, uh, people who have great pots of money, they often do, uh, people invest with people they already know. So you come in the room and, and they're already hooking up different deals and back rooms with cigars with their friends. And, uh, and that's cool, but then there's all these, and I want to speak for black women out here, who don't have access to those back rooms, who are not uh, the first thought of. So by the time they get in there to say, okay, we're going to do that, we'll keep in touch, and it's a lot of, you, you'll die of encouragement. And um, um, I just want to say, is there any sort of way around that? Because um, uh, it, it just seems to be uh, there's not a conversation or a communication going down with people who are doing really hard work and who have sustained themselves for so long, but they cannot anymore. They don't have no more friends, no more family. Uh, can kickstart another thing. And um, I think Tim and um, um, Carla can talk to it, but I just want to ask you. Yeah, yeah just quickly. Up. Um, you said a lot, just to unpack it a bit, um, not, not every entrepreneur needs to play the role as the financier of their business or the ones who go out to get the money, right? So when you, you know, if, perhaps one of the best ways could be to just develop and, and, and create something that's extraordinary or a show or do something that's amazing. Things that are amazing 
and then get out there and network, people will find you. And then you have to network with people who have that skill of how Often to you rate. you do do things extraordinary and amazing, but it's not extraordinary and amazing enough. Yeah, so then you have to network to, with people who do what they do. Raising money is a skill. Raising money, raising money is not a, a right. You know, business is not a right. I can tell you what is a right. A right of first freedom of speech, a right of first mem- Those are rights. So we need the public to make sure that they're not games being played, preventing people who have the skill to raise money, like the gentleman is talking about, to not to be prevented from getting deals. But not everyone is going to be fit for that particular task. But if you do things that the best that you can do, people will find you or you have to just keep networking and make it happen. I'm not going to make it like, oh, this is how you're going to get the money. It's not a lotto. Go to the lotto and get get rich scheme. It's, 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 it's a challenge. So so for me, when, when, when I started raising money, I didn't have the mindset of I'm going to go out and raise money. I didn't, I didn't train my brain to be a financier, okay, because that's not my skill. My skill was broadcasting. I was a great operator. I understood how to run a TV station. I knew, understood how to make money in TV. So when I went out and pitched Bain Capital, they were the money people. I was trying to sell them my skills. I was trying to sell them what I was good at so that they can invest in me, not give me money, so to speak, but invest in me so that I can get a return on investment, not only for myself because I was going to be a big equity partner, but a return on investment for them. I never profess to be a raiser of money, okay? I just, I'm just good at selling myself, okay? So if you're an entrepreneur trying to raise money, those people that you're asking people to, 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 to give you money, they know the levels of financing. They know what mezzanine financing is. They know what private equity is. They know what senior capital is. They know what levels you're going to need to finance a deal, you need to sell yourself and have them buy your idea because that's what's going to get the return on investment. Or don't take their money. Or don't take their money. That's exactly right. Well, Carla, I just want to ask you, because how did you raise your money? You said you mentioned something about CAA. Uh, you're a Latina. They see you as money bags when they, you know, because the market is so big for how they feel like um, you know, that, that demographic is growing. That may be true, but they didn't see me that way. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> at okay. all. Okay. Um, you know, Uncommon is powered by Macro, and I've been blessed. Um, Macro is owned by Charles King, um, and it has truly been a blessing because he understands the need. Um, that said, it was very difficult, and this has not been my first startup. I had a previous startup where I tried so hard to raise funds, um, and I had a lot of comments said to me and, and I wasn't successful at raising funds. But um, going back to what I do is think outside the box, right? So if you do have an idea for a show and you're having difficulty raising funds, go to a brand. They have millions of dollars that they use for advertising. And going back to what I said, people are skipping ads, sell them a show. So think outside the box. What are other ways of being able to get capital like there's a lot of crowdsourcing websites there's there's various ways that you can get capital outside of traditional funding um and i think in in my case i had to do that i mean prior to macro think outside the box to help stories be told um tim yeah just really quickly um so i think i think the uh for me at least you know and with our company we've had a, a little bit more of a traditional uh, what I'll call traditional Silicon Valley pathway to raising capital, um, you know, and so uh, is that because of your background, or is that just how you? No, I mean, I think um, so. We we started raising capital in in, in 2013 when we founded the business, um, 2012, and um, you know, back then the venture capital landscape was very different from where it is today. I mean, we when, when I was raising capital, there were maybe 15 venture capital funds that you went to, um, and they were all. You know, Sequoia, NEA, and Dreesen. All, all the, these are the names that have backed companies like Google and Apple and, and Facebook and the like. Um, and so um, the one thing that I, I sort of had an appreciation for when we were founding our company was that venture capital is not for everyone. Um, it's for a very, very specific type of business, which is high growth, high risk, um, highly volatile. Um, it's, either, it's, it's either you hit 100 or you hit a zero. Um, there are many, many, many different types of capital. You know, friends and family, angels, 
um, SBA backed loans, government grants, um, you know, bank loans, whatever the case is. But ultimately, from a business perspective, um, you have to match your business to the type of capital that you want. So if you want a high growth, very volatile business, you should go to Silicon Valley. And I guarantee you there's 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 capital you can get um, just in, in just matter of pitching your idea, just the way that the markets are, are currently structured. Um, now, they will force you um, to run your business in a certain way. Um, they will force you to try and triple your revenues, quadruple revenues, no matter what, even if it's running it straight, straight into the ground, because that's the way the funds are structured. Um, so you have to realize that if you take certain types of capital, investors are going to look for certain types of returns. So you go to VC, they're going to want 10x, 20x, 100x returns in three or four years. If you, want, if you take an SBA back loan or whatever the case is, then the return profiles are much, much lower. Um, if you go to private equity, you'll probably give up substantially more of the business, but the return profiles may be a little, bit, a little bit lower. So it's just depending on what exactly you're trying to accomplish, how fast the market is growing, and what you are trying to do, you can sort of match those capital requirements. And I think, um, you know, to, to, to your earlier point, raising money is a skill. It's, it's sort of looking at the broader capital landscape and saying, where are the, po- the pockets and the bundles of money that I need to go after? Who are the key power players and who, I, who do I need to sort of network with or get the introduction to? Um, and then from there, it's really just a matter of selling yourself and, and making sure that um, in many times, it's not even that um, the investors don't like your idea or they don't like you. It's that you know, they have their own mandates about what they're allowed to invest in. And so half the battle, at least from, from our experience in terms of raising different uh, pockets of capital is um, you know, they, they might really, really like the idea, really, really like the team, but you know, they've set up their fund to specifically invest in companies you know, between two and seven million in revenues you know, that are growing at X percent rates. Um, that are, ex- are trying to exit at in, in you know, uh, three and a half years or whatever. And that's their very, very specific criteria. And so you may be a great business, um, but if you don't fit that specific criteria, then you're just wasting everyone's time. So- but they're not giving money out there to black people. I'm sorry. It's 1%, you know, and they're not, you can come in and do all sorts of jump into, and they're not, they're not doing it, brother. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I, so, uh, you know, we, we've taken capital from, from venture capital funds like, like 645 Capital up in, up in New York that specifically invest in minor, minority uh, founders, right? And so, um, like 645 is, is notorious because they're the only venture capital firm, um, actually the only minority venture capital firm that Princeton, uh, Princeton University's endowment fund is actually sourced and invested in. Um, and so there are pockets of capital that are out there um, and increasingly large endowments and pension funds and insurance companies that are backing these funds are... Uh, investing in, in minority. I mean, this, is a, this is just a very recent phenomenon, probably in the last two or three years, where the, the diversity of capital has started to come into the markets. Can you, by the way, I just want to re- ask you real quick, can you use data as proof of concept? Like, so some people might be sitting on data they don't even know that's valuable to prove that they are, you know, making money or reaching a certain audi- audience that's valuable. Um, can you give them some advice about how to capture that? Uh, so the thing about the the technology industry, uh, and, and I consider myself more of a technology entrepreneur than a, than a media entrepreneur, is that um, there are there are so many many there's so many different ways to make money in technology. But fundamentally, what it all comes down to is who owns the data. Um, and um, what, what I tell uh, you know up and coming entrepreneurs these days is that you know we are quite literally living in the second gilded age. I mean, um, you know, in the first gilded age, you had in the sort of late 19th century, it was all about oil. I mean, it was all about how could you source oil, where do you extract it, how do you refine it, what pipelines do you send it into, what railroads do you, do you use to sort of distribute that oil. Um, in, in the 21st century, there are massive fortunes that are being made, specifically around data. And actually, the way that we talk about our business on a day-to-day basis is, is almost exactly like oil, right? We, we think about how do we extract the data, how do we refine it, what data pipelines do we send it into, how do we distribute the data, um, and so if you look at any business like uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, fundamentally all of those businesses are about who owns the data and how do you monetize that data. Um, you know, in, in Facebook or Google's case, it's they monetize the search patterns or your photos or whatever the case is, and they use all those different components to actually sell ad inventory or whatever it is on a much more targeted basis than any other player out there in the market. You know, in the case of, say, Netflix, they're, they're mining your viewing patterns all the way down to the level of the individual scene that you're watching, and they're actually using that to write scripts or write creative um, or do casting specifically based off of that data. And that's why they've been, so, you know, on a relative basis, so much more successful at programming than a lot of the, uh, the traditional players. Or, you know, Amazon is notorious for using data to sell you more product. Um, so 
regardless of what the, the business model is, if you think about the, uh, in the technology world, there's, out, there's only about you know, three or four different business models that exist, whether it's um, a marketplace business, an e-commerce business, an advertising-oriented business, a subscription-oriented business. And actually, all of those businesses revolve specifically around how can you access people's data, whether it's passively or explicitly, and then how do you monetize it differently? So if you are sitting on some form of data, um, you know, <laughs> you are sitting on, you're, it's quite like, it's like you're sitting on uh, uh, an oil field, right? There you go. And it's really just a matter of how you actually drill it out of the ground and, and extract it for value. Well, I can tell you right now, it's, a, it's like there will be blood out there. So, you know, for people who say this, anybody have any questions? Listen, we don't have much time, but we want to make sure I'm sorry if we, and um, if you can keep your answers short, please, there's a mic, and, um, and then address it, try to keep your, yeah. yeah, and we'll get as many questions as we can, sure. and we'll ask our panelists to be as quick as they can so we can answer more. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Demilia Shaw. Uh, I'm working to grow a marketing design firm here in D.C., um, Tim, I've been following your story since 2014, and so thank you for what you've done for DC. Awesome, amazing work. Um, you've shared with us what you're doing next. Would love for you to expand on that, as well as the three of you of what's next for you all. What's next? Go ahead, Carla. Well, um, we are actually developing a platform at the moment that, uh, so if you're a content creator, whether you're a producer, an influencer, you upload your profile, you put all your sh your stories, like whether it's a TV show or film, and out on the other side of the platform, so it's like a marketplace, you have brands who are able to go and search. So if I'm looking for a lesbian Latina storyline, the show Vida will populate, and then you can have a conversation about what you can do together. And so the idea is to populate it with as many stories of people of color and then bring this platform to as many brands as possible so that they can start integrating into stories and, and start co-marketing with stories. Nandel was next. Or no, the one. So after Sorry. closing all my stations in Indianapolis, which should be into September, October, uh, I want to get uh, the Multicultural News Network launched on a nationwide platform so we will have a voice uh, from our perspective by our people. What's the stuff? Uh, for me, it's the same. I'm just just continuing to be an entrepreneur and a and a, and a change agent and connecting public private partnerships that are genuine to really help people with great innovation and ideas make their dreams happen. Tim, uh, we're just continuing to invest in our in our products. Uh, we're expanding to, to different countries around the world. You know, I I set a goal for our product team to um, essentially take every law and every regulation on every country on the planet and digitize it on one singular technology platform. Um, and so we're, uh, we're making progress. We're about a third of the way there, but my hope is that in the next two or three years or so, we can make that fully possible. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, great discussion. I'm Arnold King. I own a uh, business, consulting business. Now my question to uh, Dewan and uh, on a, I'm only a T station. What to look for when get a T station? And also, uh, Kyle, I do business plan and trends and analysis and uh, social and target market one of them. And uh, what to look for when doing a marketing plan when it comes to advertising. Thank you. So that's a pretty, pretty big question, but uh, there's really not one single thing you need to look at when you own a TV station. Uh, just keep in mind when you buy a product, that is when you win, okay? Not when you sell it, okay? So if you don't buy your property right, if you don't know have the skills to look at all the variables of a TV station, you can buy wrong and you can fail. Data first. So I'm very data oriented. When you come, when you're creating a marketing plan or a marketing analysis, always look at the numbers because they'll be sobering for whatever idea you have. Martin, your question. Yes, and I just wanted to, it's more of a comment because you raised an excellent question for the women in the room that have had struggles getting early venture or early investments. Real quick, there is a website called WeFunder. One sister who created Mama's Tees, she initially raised 500000 on WeFunder by using the Jobs Act, Jumpstart Our Business Act that was done by Obama. It allows you to raise money from non-accredited investors on social media. So the whole dismissing raising money 
via uh, websites like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. There's another level of websites. WeFunder is one, and Crowd, uh, sorry, True Crowd is another one that allows you to raise money through the internet. And we know that black women tweet the most and black women blog the most. So you sisters can raise money. It's not a, it's not a barrier to entry anymore. The second thing, real quick, is Kwame. His name is Kwame A N K U. He's the founder of the Black Star Fund. If you follow him on LinkedIn, once a year, the black and brown angel investors meet in New York and they blog about it, they tweet about it, and we don't show up to support them. So we need to support these brothers and sisters who are out there like Precursor Ventures, Backstage Capital. There is ways for us to make money and to get the investments we need. We just have to be present and mindful and especially be on LinkedIn. Excellent. And last question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alonda Thomas. I'm Director of Public Relations at Howard University. Thank you for being here today, and I welcome all of you to come to our university and share your talent and your knowledge with our students. Um, I also am a former PR manager at TV One, where I worked on the show News One Now with Roland Martin. So my question is for you, Mr. McCoy, with the... Um, Props, the project that you want to launch, have you thought about collaborating with the TV One that is already looking for news content? Because when News One Now went away, the black community really suffered, and we need something like that. 100%, that's part of the prep plan. Aha! Yes. Thank you so much to our panelists. You know, uh, follow them on their uh, their social media. Uh, look at their companies. See, uh, look look at the videos on YouTube. I'm sure they've given multiple interviews where they'll have more nuggets in it. And um, if you get a chance to say hello, that type of a thing. But I think we get, when we get to know them and we follow their stories, we'll know more about how, what we can do and how we can leverage uh, the um, their adventures into our own journey. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here, and it was a pleasure to to meet you all. <laughs>